Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Conversation Design Podcast by Bot Society, where we interview designers and developers and ask them questions about conversation design, creativity, and more. My name is Monica. I'm a product manager at Bot Society, and I will be your host today. On this episode, I interview Hilary Hayes, conversation designer at Facebook. Hillary has emerged as a thought leader in the conversation design and voice experience space, using her background in design research and design thinking to shape the future of voice design. She is a strong proponent of sharing thoughts and ideas about this field as a way of creating a future for the voice ecosystem. Continue listening to hear from Hillary about building a career in conversation design through emerging tech and research utilizing her training in industrial design and design thinking to shape the future of voice design, where the voice experience ecosystem is going, and more. Hope you enjoy. Thank you for being on the podcast. We're happy to have you today on this episode. Welcome. Hi, Monica. I'm so thrilled to be here. Amazing. I'm particularly happy to have you on the episode because I remember when we met at Voice Summit, um, and there was so yes. much there was so much energy um, around not only you know developing your career and this field, but also just how the ecosystem is is being developed in conversation design and particularly voice. Um, so I'm excited about our conversation today. Awesome. Yeah, no, it was great to meet you and the rest of the uh, the whole Bot Society gang. I feel like you all were all over the place and everywhere at all times. And a special shout out to Bianca as well. Yeah, Voice Summit 2019 was huge. It was definitely an inflection point in my career. And in fact, one of the panels that I was on was about research mm-hmm. in the voice space. I've got lots of exciting things to talk about with you today. Amazing. So let's get started. For those listening that aren't familiar with your background and your career, could you please introduce yourself and tell us what you do and where you've come from? Absolutely. So I am Canadian, first of all. I studied industrial design and wearable technology at OCAD University in Toronto, Ontario. So during my undergraduate degree there, I started getting kind of these senses that things weren't going to be physical things much longer. And so through my work with wearable technology and emerging technology, I was able to get into my first design role, which was actually a research assistant for what would become the Muse brainwave reading headband with a company called Interaxon that are Toronto-based as well. So I got my start in design research and then design research ended up sort of taking me full circle into what I would find was going to be voice experiences. That's awesome. So how did you get into conversational design and voice experiences? So this is kind of a funny question. I get asked this a lot. I wish I had a more romantic answer for it. But in all honesty, I've always had a, a real passion for emerging tech. And I'm a very curious person. So about two and a half years ago, when I was product designer at the time, uh, moving into a design research role at my former role, which was Connected, product development agency. My manager just came to me one day and said, well, asked, have you ever worked in voice design? I said, no. And he said, well, do you want to? And I said, yes. And that's how I got on my first voice design project, which was creating a voice experience that would launch in conjunction with the launch of Echoes and Amazon Alexa in Canada. So that was in the fall of 2017. You told us about your early training and your early career in user and design research. How has that affected your approach to working on conversation design projects? Is there anything that particularly helped or anything that was uh, more different than you expected? So one of the key things from my design education, which was fairly traditional as things go, in industrial design was the fact that OCAD stressed design thinking as part of the education. So that was finding and meeting real user needs and testing early and often to make sure that we're creating something that's really valuable to the user. And that's definitely been a continuous narrative thread through my whole career. Like I mentioned, I started out as a research assistant and I ended up doing work under the title of a senior design researcher in my last role that led me 
deeper into what I would learn was conversation design. And so research is something that I continue to do, especially within the conversation design space. There's a lot of um, great research that you can do with users, even before you've really done a, a ton of work at all as far as designing the experience. One key thing that you can do is utterance capturing. So essentially giving the user context. So what maybe they're going to plan a, a weekend away. So you give them that context and then you give them either a live smart speaker or just a, um, a prototype device. And you say, okay, well, what would you ask? If this was the context you're in, what would you ask for? What would you want to know? And then figure out what people want to ask, what you've designed for already, maybe at that point, and then where those gaps are that you can fill in with scripting um, through utterance capture and early user testing. And then, of course, once you've created a voice experience and prototyped it in various fidelity, you can once again return to your users and put that in front of them and see how that's meeting their expectations for what the functionalities are that they would be looking to fulfill in those contexts. That's a great tip. I like that you touched exactly on the process you follow. What intrigued you most about conversation design? I'm curious. Well, I mean, aside from my background in uh, just emerging tech and general curiosity, it feels like magic. It feels like in Harry Potter when spells are cast and charms are invoked just by saying certain words. It's Mm -hmm. incredible. It can be really powerful experiences. And aside from that, it can provide experiences that are accessible to folks who may not be able to access other analogous experiences using more like quote unquote traditional graphical Mm. user interface. Wow. (laughs) That makes a lot of sense now that I remember Harry Potter and exactly how things go. (laughs) Yeah, it's like casting spells. So where does your passion for emerging tech come from? Like I said, I've always just been super curious and I wanted to know how things work. And I love daydreaming about how things can be improved. And even and especially really banal, everyday things, I love thinking about how they could be different in the future. And that's why I take a lot of inspiration from like sci-fi movies, even things like really silly stuff, like Netflix's new reality show, The Circle. I love looking at that, looking at assistants like Jarvis in Iron Man and seeing how fantasy is informing how people are being taught about what they could expect from Mm. voice experiences in a way that is really non-threatening. It's sort of like how Pokemon Go has done a lot to normalize augmented reality. I feel like there's a lot of really great pieces of media that have helped to normalize and also push forward in a number of ways voice technology. Yeah. You were the 2019 Alexa Cup Canada winner. Congratulations. Thank Um, you. Could you tell us more about that process and how you went on to, to win that cup? Sure. First of all, I want to call out that I was on the team that won. There were five of us. was one of the very few rules that were put forward for us ahead of the competition. So I'd like to also give a big shout out to Brian, Denis, Jess, and Guy, my other teammates. We all definitely won this together and worked our butts off for it. So the process was a little bit of strategic foresight at the beginning, where we were zeroing in on what spaces we wanted to work on. Because like I said, the only rule really was that we had to show up on competition day with five people. We could do as much work ahead of time as we wanted to. And there was a scorecard that we had been given ahead of time. So I used the information from the scorecard that we'd been provided and then used that to create a uh, a creative matrix. So Mm -hmm. uh, a grid, essentially, where the vertical elements were the different points that we needed to win on the scorecard. And then columns um, going across horizontally were the different areas that we were targeting in a more macro sense. And then we would do some brainstorming. And we ended up zooming in on automotive and specifically decided to work with or work on a project for the company Zipcar, a number of points within their experience. And then from there, we were able to pull out these kind of experience chapters like booking a vehicle, navigating to the actual vehicle, 
And then when you're in the vehicle and then potentially dropping it off, to see where voice could really excel and could help assuage some of the concerns that we had heard through some pretty scrappy research that we were able to do in the two weeks that we had before the competition. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then through there, we were able to use those informed vignettes to create sample scripts. And then uh, my incredible engineers, uh, Guy and Brian, whipped up some real magic with... Mm -hmm. I think our presentation ended up being three different hard-coded prototypes, but Mm -hmm. they did work. It was pretty incredible. And we were able to do things that we were kind of surprised that we were able to currently do. Uh We did an API sweep and found that we could already use voice through the existing Zipcar app structure to honk the horn Uh of the vehicle in case you were having trouble finding it in a parking garage or something. Oh, wow. Yeah. And well, one of the... Actually, the biggest accomplishment, I think, that I took away from winning the Alexa Cup Canada was actually that, sure, we won the Alexa Cup, but we also won People's Choice. And I feel like that actually Mm -hmm. says more because all the teams, we were all able to vote for another team for Mm -hmm. who we thought we would win. And we ended up taking home the People's Choice Award Mm -hmm. as well. For me, that was even more powerful. Yeah, and I've used Zipcar before and I can see how the problems you were solving, they're pretty relatable in this day and age with all of these apps. That's a great idea to incorporate a voice into that. There was definitely a few moments that we found that were really easily solved by voice. One of them was the classic human error of inaccurately estimating your remaining trip time. The zip car works because everybody... It's kind of like how libraries work. Like if if you got to return the books so that somebody else can take it out. We were able to enable people to just using voice modify their existing bookings and even proactively notify them if the total distance that they needed to travel in order to drop off the car exceeded the amount of time they had left in the booking. We would be able to notify them and then prompt them to extend their booking. So when is the car implementing this, please? (laughs) I think they're aware of it now. I don't know how much I can say about that. You mentioned your team. What do you think makes a good team or a great team for developing voice app? Oh, for sure. I think a key to a really great team is diversity and diversity in skill sets, like diversity in all set, all meanings of the, the term. So within the team, we had myself as a conversational designer. We had a PM. PMs are absolutely worth their weight in gold. And she kept us all on track and on time. And then we had a tech lead and software engineer. And I think one of the key things that I look for in software engineers are to have folks that are really product-oriented. It's great to have people who have strong technical chops, but it's incredible to work with people who can create this new tech while still driving the best experiences forward with the user in mind. Mm -hmm. Like creating something not just because it rationally makes sense or because it can exist, but creating something that is going to be helpful. And just keeping the user in mind at all times. And then Denis, our incredible effects wizard, was able to create a really beautiful presentation deck for us. And then also when we moved on to the next round of the cup, he created a demo video for us that I think you can find on Vimeo now. In general, how have you seen the conversation design ecosystem develop and grow over time? I've only been working in conversation design for about two and a half years now. But in that time, I've seen a lot of natural language processing and natural language understanding advancements. So for instance, one of our engineers uh, who I've worked with quite closely, he has a quite strong French accent. And at first, when we first started working on Amazon Alexa-based experiences, it had a quite a bit of trouble understanding him, but it's gotten drastically better just in a couple of years. So I think that's been a major thing that I've noticed. I've also, like I mentioned, with more voice experiences being shown in media, it's just become so much more normalized for people Mm -hmm. to consider engaging with the voice experience. And uh, more people have tried it now, honestly. And so it's becoming a little bit more demystified. How much of the ecosystem being developed do you think is on the end users versus the people and the companies that are working on conversation design? 
One thing that I've been really surprised about and I'm still sort of disappointed in is the big companies like Amazon and Google who are creating all this hardware. It seems like they've kind of been more interested in like shipping hardware than they have been about creating experiences or fostering a lot of maker culture around voice experience crafting. There haven't been a lot of stances taken by the companies that are producing the hardware on things like norms of what visualizing a voice experience looks like. Creating conversation maps, that's something that I've become really interested in, Mm -hmm. is creating something that I can look at, I can edit, but I can also pass to my client. I can pass to my engineers, my PM, and Mm -hmm. we can all have input onto this one document and be informed by what the text looks like, the different states of the experience, how we're visualizing what an error looks like, how we're handling first use onboarding versus returning onboarding, and being able to come to a consensus as a team or even hopefully as an industry and as a practice about what these things look like. And I think that that's an area that there's been some slow, gradual growth happening on the more like independent outside of those large companies. But I'm really curious to see what will happen when somewhere like Google decides to finally let us see what they think a conversation map looks like. Yeah, for sure. And like you said, because some of the bigger players haven't chipped in on this kind of this particular field, it has left a lot of opportunity. Like it's very exciting to work in product at Boss Society and build a tool where you can, we're going to launch in a couple of months, but build a new voice tool where you can visualize all of this and actually build like team team features and build kind of a tool for the future so that we can see more and more voice apps being not just normalized, but kind of looked forward to. That's awesome. And that's like the silver lining of the fact that the big players haven't. They've let this gap happen is that there is so much innovation being done and so many different avenues being explored in voice design visualization. How's your personal use of uh, voice enabled or voice first um, devices changed over time? Well, I have a, a few smart speakers around my house. And, but because of the work I do, I also have a lot of uh, little notebooks that live with them. Since <laughs> I like to take little notes of when I'm engaging with a voice experience and it replies in a way that I'm surprised by or I was expecting something different. Or even if I ask for something that I normally ask for and the reply I get has been changed since the last time I'd asked for that, I kind of like taking little notes down about different things. And uh, I feel like I am maybe too inside baseball on that. Uh, (laughs) But I love seeing changes happen. Speaking of you taking, like jotting down notes and all of this, you have a very active blog about all of this. I would definitely call you a thought leader on this field. Thank Highly you, recommend you. your uh, Medium blog to everyone. So you've written about the positioning of VR since you also do research in that and how it's limited to gaming for now. And that's kind of... You write about how that might be the reason why it hasn't taken off as well as everyone expected it to. How is voice being positioned and do you think it's going to reach an optimal mass soon? So one of the key things that affected how I thought about VR and and AR and mixed reality and all those other things is uh, I was at the Oculus Connect conference in Mm -hmm. 2018 and Michael Abrash was speaking and he said a quote that changed how I was thinking about VR forever. He said that the biggest competition for VR wasn't TV. It was real estate. Mm -hmm. And that just like blew my mind wide open. Thinking about the possibilities of layered experiences and transpatial experiences using augmented and virtual reality. It's just so much bigger than gaming because like you can play a board game in your living room, but you can do so many other things in your living room too. Yeah. That space is full of opportunity. Mm-hmm. And especially if you can use things like virtual reality to really deeply change the context of the space that you're in 
It's yeah. just so powerful. It really, the way that I positioned it, the article that I wrote was about mostly remote work and mm-hmm. how augmented and virtual reality could be used in a really powerful way for folks who are working remotely, whether that they do that full time or they're traveling to be able to, whether it's pop up in a coffee shop and be able to suddenly have all their documents right in front of them or Mm. their whole mood board spread out around them or that they can remap the volumes of an existing space in their home to function as a painting studio or Mm. to eliminate distractions so that they can focus and do writing. And I truly feel like the application and intersection of voice in VR and AR is, and I keep coming back to it, is magic. Because you'd be able to call for not only actions through voice, but you could affect the world around you through voice in really interesting ways. Wow. Yeah, the opportunities are really endless. And I hope more people take into account what you said and what um, what was said in that conference. That's really impactful. So you also write about... Really like that, um, where you speak about using weight conditions instead yeah. of weight words. Can you tell us more about this prediction? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that I've been noticing is that, and actually, the Google commercial during the Super Bowl was mm-hmm. a great example of this. Yeah. They had a very powerful, very emotional commercial during the Super Bowl. There was a man talking to his assistant and talking about his deceased wife, one of the things that I noticed was a suspicious lack of wake words. Mm -hmm. So for instance, I believe he only said, hey, Google, once, maybe twice at most in the commercial. Mm -hmm. And so I definitely see the move away from explicit wake words into what I'm calling implicit wake conditions. Mm -hmm. So recognizing, for instance, when when a user turns to look at a device or is facing the device housing the assistant or does a gesture, taking cues from more human interactions so that people don't have to say things like, hey, Google, hey, Alexa, all the time. Also, I'm so sorry to anyone's devices I may have triggered just now. I really apologize. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But yeah, so just looking at things like gaze detection and face recognition, hand tracking, that's one thing that uh, there's been a huge Uh amount of advancement in in the last, even just the last year. And like body position detection. And there's some things that have already been done with this that are really exciting. So with um, the, even with going back to the early models of the Amazon Echo, how it has the LEDs that indicate directional listening, that's really exciting. And then the way that Apple Face ID handles interaction through facial gestures and, and even things, really silly stuff. Like I was coming back to, games are great because they help normalize technology and interaction. So like Snapchat or Instagram face filters where you have to raise your eyebrows or open your mouth or something like that and do facial gestures to engage with certain filters. That's very interesting. And then with the implementation of Google's Project Soli or what's being called Motion Sense now on the Google Pixel 4, Mm -hmm. that you can do gestures or you can lean and look at it and it can recognize your face. Like These are all things that I see as being things that are going to be coming soon to voice experiences to Mm -hmm. create experiences that are fundamentally more human and less robotic. In voice experience design, we can actually take from what's been proven in other fields and try to employ that so that voice experiences become mainstream um, faster. One thing I wanted to touch upon was how can we use the lessons learned from other fields to make voice design an inclusive space, both in end products and the talent that's working on it. Oh, absolutely. As I outlined it above, I think that uh, the success that I found while competing in the Alexa Cup was really only possible because of the diverse skill set of my team. That we had people from design, from research, more strategy-oriented PMs, tech leads, um, really product-oriented engineering. That the secret sauce is really the overlap and the collaboration of those different practices. Um, And fundamentally, you've got to have a representative sample of the population during building and testing of any product. If you don't, 
it can be pretty embarrassing. It can lead to something that's mediocre at best and could waste a lot of money or even offensive and useless to your user group at worst. Do you think inclusive product development is more about the inclusive having an inclusive process or having an end product with which you intend to serve it? Oh, sure. I think that's a, kind of a chicken and egg thing. You've got to have an inclusive product development team in order to create something that is truly inclusive. Because the only way that you can really create something for your user that's going to be meaningful for them is if you, at bare minimum, um, which I think is table stakes now, is to have a really deep sense of empathy for your user. And a lot of the time that can only come with actively engaging with them and collaborating with them, which is why I love uh, leading co-collaboration sessions, uh, creating alongside our target users uh, so that they can have a hand in actually designing or scripting for the product that they're going to be using. And then, like I mentioned earlier, just continuously checking in and testing with your users. Mm -hmm. And then also having a number of people on the team who are representative of what the population looks like and what the population of the people that you're designing for looks like that's going to bring up small nuances that you may not have even considered, especially in conversation design when communication is so crucial to any part of the human experience, but it is something that we are so deeply imperfect at. Having just more people to take their lived experience and contribute that to what you're making is just going to create something that's better. Mm -hmm. How are we going to centralize voice best practices and processes to make voice experiences more mainstream? You write about this on your blog. Right. So I think that fostering communication and collaboration and just sharing of ideas, all things that the internet is great for, is going to be key to establishing some best practices and processes, which it sort of reminds me of when I was first getting into UX design. There weren't a ton of consensus around what different visual elements even looked like yet. Didn't have sticker sheets like we do now. Like you can go on like the Sketch app sources, I think it's called, download sketch files that you can essentially mix and match and create anything out of. Mm -hmm. We just didn't have that. People hadn't fully agreed on what things even looked like yet. I mean, it's frustrating because it's tough to get started, but it's also really exciting because if you engage with that, conversation, for a lack of a better term, you get to be one of the voices who are crafting what these norms are going to be. And I just think right now is such an exciting time for anybody to join in and, and work on this. And whenever I give a lecture about conversation design or I show the different visuals and map pieces that I've been putting together, what I'm really looking for and what I'm hoping for is for somebody to come back to me in six months and say, I think you're wrong, and here's why. Because that's going to elevate the whole practice. If somebody's able to tell me, like, no, I don't think help states should look like that, or I found a better way of like labeling components, like that's super exciting. And that's something that I would challenge everybody to do more of and to share what your conversation maps look like, what your visualizations of voice experiences look like, to, to see where those patterns are starting to emerge. Yeah, um, that's a great kind of message to everyone. And I, I can definitely see now how you're very passionate about emerging tech. And this is exactly what's needed in emerging tech is this collaboration and back and forth. You touched on this a little bit earlier, but I want to ask, well, what's a voice experience you're a fan of? So I find that actually that a lot of the voice experiences that really re- resonate with me are from movies like Jarvis from Iron Man, like I mentioned, or even the app in Netflix's uh, reality show, The Circle. Media is such a great way of exploring what may not be necessarily possible right now, but things that could be. And to set sort of users' expectations mm-hmm. towards things that are a bit like even loftier. And that's one area, once again, that I think the big tech companies have fallen short on is setting user expectations. Um, So for instance, this is why I think uh, Amazon Alexa was really successful in ways that Apple's Siri wasn't because of the gap in expectations. So Siri was released and the, I mean, they really promised 
the moon with her. Like you can do anything. It's your virtual assistant, Mm -hmm. all this stuff. And then when she couldn't deliver on these really incredible promises, then people just, just wrote it off. And I feel like that was pretty harmful to the voice practice as a whole. Whereas when Amazon's Alexa was introduced, it was the, the expectations were set that you could play music and set timers. And when people realized that you could get recipes or check the weather too, Mm -hmm. it was like mind blowing and incredible and like, whoa, everyone has to have one of these. So I think setting expectations is so key. And, and another thing is addressing the existing flaws in the mental model that Mm -hmm. has been set up around voice experiences. This is something that may be helped a bit as we move away from explicit Mm -hmm. words. Um, Because right now, you're essentially... I like to use the metaphor of the telephone operator. Uh So you talk to the telephone operator, your your device-level assistant. You ask them to connect you to a specific voice app or experience. Uh But then, strangely enough, when you want to take actions within that voice app or experience, you have to ask the device-level assistant to do those actions, Mm -hmm. which is really strange. Uh, It's as if the telephone operator stayed on the line the whole time (laughs) and had to kind of convey any message to the the person that you were talking to. So I feel like when once we can get past wake words, that's going to unlock so much goodness and so much more truly conversational experiences. And it'll really change in a very helpful way how people think about voice experiences. It's reminding me of... uh... You mentioned liking voice experiences in media. Now I'm thinking of a telephone operator. Exactly. uh, Example in media. (laughs) Yeah, no, exactly. Because they're normally, they don't say anything else. They, the person just says like, oh, connect me to Jane Smith. And then the operator goes, okay, connect to you now. And that's the end of it. Yeah. And they don't have to go like, oh, operator, tell Jane I'm free at four on Tuesday. But that's how we're dealing with with voice experiences right now, which I think is really interesting. And uh, I'm excited for when we get to move past that. Yeah, excited for uh, what's to come. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. So ahead of the podcast, we took a bunch of audience questions and I'm going to ask a couple of those right now. Thank you to everyone who submitted questions. And we already just wanted to give a quick shout out. We already covered... Zoe's question about how you started designing like voice interfaces and uh, how you got your beginning in conversation design. So this is a slightly more technical question, but it definitely it touches on how even conversation design has developed over time. So Tom from Advisero um, asked about uh, buttons or, or choices should should designers use them? On one hand, they help user navigate, but on the other hand, they make the bot look like old-fashioned uh, Facebook bot. Tom, thank you for this question. One area that I pretty much always point people to is the Google Conversational Design Guidelines. And within those, there's lots of different things that could be related to buttons, chips, and um, different little interaction moments uh, within companion screens to voice experiences. For instance, if there was a list that needed to be reviewed and the user might select an option, uh, I am in total favor of using all available input methods since voice may not always be most appropriate for the context or the user could be in, they could be on the go and they could change contexts and they could go from somewhere, for instance, in their car where it might be totally socially acceptable and they would feel fine about speaking out loud to their assistant, they could move to a semi-public space where they might feel a little less comfortable, like a coffee shop, about saying things out loud. So allowing them to also have on-screen methods can be really helpful. That's a great point. We're back to the questions about career path and uh, getting started in um, in voice. Sarah Morris from... University of Washington asked about career path, salary range for conversation designers. Uh, what can you share about this? Mm, good question. So I would say conversation design it is an interesting field because in many ways, it's 
really still emerging. But in other ways, it's been around for a long time. So there's practitioners like Margaret Urban and Kathy Pearl who have been doing this for uh, quite a while and are really established voices in this space and as part of this whole emerging practice. And I would say that the career path, I think, for those people is through more of a linguistics perspective. Um, This wave of conversation designers that I'm presently part of, the one thing that I find is really exciting is that we all come from very diverse backgrounds and that, as far as I know, impossible to study conversation design, which is really exciting because when I got into UX design, uh, there wasn't any way that you could have studied it. So Mm -hmm. it was the same sort of thing that the courses didn't exist yet. And so you really had to just look at what practitioners are doing, what they're sharing, what they're writing about on on Medium and looking at the resources that are available and focus on what you do have and what you can bring to the role. Because conversation designers right now, they might have been, they could be from more technical perspective, like a software engineer. They could be anthropologists. Like there's really, you can come from wherever you are and bring the tools that you have to be part of this practice. I would also say that if you're getting into conversation design, start making, start writing about what you're learning. It is really never too early to share. You don't have to be creating brand new information. As long as you're getting your voice out there and you're being seen in the space, uh, that will do great things for your career. Yeah. And so now that you covered all that, um, we got this question from Natalie Scott, uh, from Natalie Scott UX, Maggie Pitt from... 247.ai, Sharon Johnson from Samsung, Akansha Boston from DSC. And then this is a little bit more specific. Um, sure. Ramona Jones from World Catchers asked if there's a best approach to move into voice design from technical writing and become a contributor to the field. You kind of covered it, but... Yeah. So like I mentioned... Really just start learning. Um, the Google Conversational Design Guidelines are a great place to start as well. Truly just start and write about what you learned. It, you've been After you've been doing it for a month, write a Medium post and say like, I've been working in conversation design for a month. Here's what I've learned so far. Yeah. Like, that's great. And tag me in it. Like, when you do that, tag me. I want to see that. This is so exciting to see people start working in this practice and start having opinions. And like I mentioned, I want people to be able to disagree with me. I want to be able to have discourse about it. That is all that I want. And don't feel like you need to wait until you're whatever. Again, I've only been specifically in voice for two and a half years. Don't worry about it so much. Just get creating. Medium is a really great resource for reading about voice design and uh, AI and all the kind of tangential things to that. And then also, uh, kind of shameless plug, last year, a uh, 12-part on-demand video course series um, with BrainStation Mm -hmm. that should be available later this spring, I believe. So that will be about voice design specifically. That's great. We also here at Bot Society have partnerships with um, organizations like Robocopy or UX Writers Collective. So all of these things that we mentioned check them out and see what you can find out there and start learning. So yeah, feel free. Hillary said you should reach out to her and mention her. Yes, please. Uh, Feel free to reach out to our team here at Bot Society. We're very happy to help. As I said, our platform has been out now for a while, but we've been working on a new version of our voice platform that will be released soon. So It's all a very exciting time for this field. Yes, yes, it's huge. And I want to plug one more thing. Um, So I'm part of the social media team for an organization called Women in Voice. The Women in Voice Twitter is a great resource. If you want to know about events, resources, there's some incredible people who are part of that. Right now, we are gearing up for our Valentine's Day uh, mentorship matchup where you can... I hope it's still open by the time this goes up. You can follow the link through the Women in Voice Twitter. You can sign up as a mentor or mentee or both and get matched up with other women, gender minorities, and non-binary people who are working in the voice space. I have volunteered as a mentor and um, the aforementioned um, superstar, Kathy Pearl, 
mm-hmm. has also volunteered as a mentor. So could be a chance to get a 30-minute meeting with a leader in the voice field. So that would be a great way to turbocharge your career as a, a young maker. That's amazing. I'm thinking I should sign up as a young uh, professional in this field. <laughs> yeah, you absolutely yeah. should. <laughs> amazing. Thank you so much, Hillary, for speaking to us today. I was very happy to have you. And congratulations on your new role you. as a conversation designer at Facebook. We're excited to have you in the Bay Area. Although I, I think you're leaving the Toronto space in a really good spot. So happy to have you in the Bay Area. Welcome. Thank uh, you. I'm definitely not going to miss the weather. We're having like a crazy <laughs> snowstorm right now. And I am just thinking about palm trees. Uh, I can't <laughs> wait. Awesome. Have a great day. And thank you everyone for listening. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. That's all for this episode. We hope that you liked it. We'll continue to interview people in the chat and voice spaces in different fields. Know someone who would be a good fit or have a topic request? Let us know at info at botsociety.io or at botsociety on any social media. Bot Society is a conversational design tool. With Bot Society, you can design voice and chatbot interactions in the same way that you can design apps or websites with Sketch or Figma. We have a free plan. Check it out on botsociety.io.